What's up, wrestling fans? Welcome to another pay-per-view point edition, the first of many during this week of the Smart Cow Moment Smack Talk podcast. We are going to get into our predictions for NXT TakeOver Stand and Deliver that's coming up this Wednesday and Thursday night. You should know the score by now, but if you don't, I am your host as always, Tony Mango. Joining me as always, I've got Callum Wiggins. Howdy. <laughs> Howdy there, buckaroo. And <laughs> Robert D. Police. Yes, I know the way. <laughs> we are going to be running down the card. We're going to be talking about, well, the cards, because it's a two-night event, and we're not going to break this up into two different podcasts, because that would just be crazy. And we're going to be talking about our predictions for the matches. What do we think is going to go down? What are we excited for? What do we feel was a little bit lacking in a build? All the kind of stuff that we normally do here. And just the same as always, we want to make sure that you give your opinions as well. So drop a comment below or send a tweet at Smartout Moment or just do something that, you know, lets us know what you have to say about this, what your thoughts are for your own predictions and all that preview content, but also your thoughts on what we've got to say as well. If you want to make sure that you are helping this channel grow in the future as well, then while you're over there and leaving your comments on YouTube, then hit that like button hit the applause button, hit the share button. If you want to pass this around to anybody, that helps out a great deal, especially if you post something on like Reddit or something. And then there's the join button, which is the same as the subscribe, or not the subscribe button. That's not the same one. There is the, the uh, join button, the same as the Patreon, I should say. Patreon.com slash smart out moment, where you can donate a buck towards our cause and help us grow all the way up to whatever you uh, what you got the spare change for and what you feel like we are worth in a month. So take advantage of the different tiers that we have there, the Dark Cast podcast that you'll only get on the Patreon, the Pick Your Poison tier where you can make sure that we do anything in particular and anything that you do like that is awesome and it's greatly, greatly appreciated and it really legitimately helps us do more content here and it helps my sanity of just being like, oh, you love me, you really love me. Okay, well then I'll keep doing this. And the subscribe button is something that you should definitely be doing and ring that little notification bell. I want to get a couple things out of the way before we get started on here. One of them being a reminder that we've got the contests going on right now on smartoutmoment.com as just a means to thank you guys for supporting everything. So there are three that are going on, two of them on Smartout Moment and one of them elsewhere. The Smartout Moment ones that you might be interested in are the NWO t-shirt giveaway, and then there's also a, an Edge Funko Pop that uh, are being sponsored through TV Store Online and Fun.com. There's also one over on FanboysAnonymous.com where you can win a Baron Zemo Funko Pop. So if you're interested in Falcon and the Winter Soldier, go ahead and check that out. It's very, very easy to join in on the contest because pretty much there's, uh, there's like nine ways that you can log in through it. And then you get points and entries by doing things like checking out the WrestleMania predictions page or following us on Facebook and Twitter and different things like that. So go ahead and do that while you can put your entries in and good luck to potentially win the, uh, the Baron Zemo and the edge and the uh, NWO little giveaways that we've got going on here. We've got on the smart madness tournament as well that we got going on to determine what is in the finals for WrestleMania weekend. And uh, what's the best pay-per-view name of all time. So we will talk some more stuff like that later on. Let's get into the NXT TakeOver Stand and Deliver card. Again, as I said, it's night one and night two. They are splitting this up. And if you aren't aware of how they're doing that yet, night one is going to be simulcast on both the WWE Network on Peacock and on the USA Network. So it's the same as a regular episode of NXT, the way that they've done in the past, where it's like, well, it's a great American bash, but it's you know, just an episode of NXT. Whereas the second night is just going to be on the network on Peacock. So if you've got Peacock situated, you can watch it on both. You definitely have to on the second night. If you haven't gotten that sorted out yet, and you really want to make sure that you are watching night one, you can still check it out on at least the USA network, but night two, that's when you got to figure that out. So we are treating this as if it's both just take over give it the same predictions as we would if they were both on just the regular WWE network and just one big 10 card, uh, 10 match show. How are you guys in general feeling about either 
the knights separately or the knights as one whole between them? Are you feeling like this is splitting the difference and it's uh it would have been better as one big big card or do you just treat it as like oh well you know it's just a little bit of a break i hate it i i think they're trying to maximize everything and it's almost obnoxious because like we always talk about our coverage out of things so let's take that part out of it for a second you could do this in one night outside of one match, which you're doing it the way you're doing it because you have a two night setup. I don't see a reason for this. I don't see a reason for mania to be two nights. Quite frankly, I think this is just like, Hey, let's stretch everything because we can. And this is a billion times better as two nights. (laughs) Two completely different perspectives. Well, you, instead of like having to sit through a four, five, six hour long show where you get, by the time you get to the final match, you're completely burned out and you just want to be doing anything else other than watching wrestling. You split it over two, two to three hour long shows, which will probably be of high quality considering the cards that we've got laid out right now. That seems to me a much more preferable option. And there's obviously a reason why they're doing it is that they need to do one final episode of NXT on Wednesday night for the USA Network which they all do, and they've stacked it with some really good matches, which is probably their final desperate attempt to score more po- viewers than N- than uh, AEW. Not without fo- telling you, though, hey, if you watch it on Peacock, you'll get it without commercials, so watch it on Peacock instead of USA. Yeah, absolutely, but it's just a case of people will probably just by type watch it on the USA network, and that means that essentially it's their one final chance to go, See, we're not leaving Wednesday night because AEW kicked our asses every single week because we beat them on the final time we were here. <laughs> we're just moving because the hockey's starting and all that other stuff, which realistically is true. It is only because of the hockey. It's not because of AEW. They'd still be on, AEW. They'd still be on Wednesday nights if it weren't for the hockey, but that's beside the point. Um, but yeah, splitting it over two nights just makes it more digestible, I feel. And that's why I'm happy that WrestleMania is two nights. So I'm really uh, not looking forward to when it gets put back to just one night of just endless wrestling and stupid jokes. I feel like if this was one night, we would cut at least four of the matches. Well, at least three, maybe not four. I don't imagine that, of course, the North American Championship would just be one match. The Kushida and Pete Dunne match wouldn't be on the card. Walter Ciampa wouldn't be on the card. And then maybe the tag team titles in some fashion. I don't know. But... I'm interested. I'm excited. I think that all of the matches to a certain degree are going to be good. And if I get two rock solid nights of wrestling in a row, NXT is the product that I like the best right now. So I'm looking forward to that. But I also think that the way that they've chosen which ones go on which night for the most part, makes sense. And I don't know how to feel about that because it's not like logic has been something that's been in WWE a lot uh, recently. So that kind of makes me happy too. That It's like, okay, well, yeah, you know, they they picked some of the right things to go in the right spots and that's kind of neat, you know? <laughs> so... I'm higher on some matches than I am on some other matches, and we don't know exactly how the card is going to lay out with a full lineup of, like, this match and then that match and then that match, but we're going to go in an order that I think kind of makes sense, at least in my brain. So, night one, I'm assuming that we're going to kick things off with the vacated NXT Tag Team Championship Triple Threat match. I feel like that's a way to get some exciting match on the card and to promise people, Hey, by the end of this match, you're getting new champions. So it's a hook to start the show at the very least. We got grizzled young veterans, James Drake and Zach Gibson. Take your shoes off. Legato del Fantasma, Joaquin Wilde and Raul Mendoza. And every time I say Mendoza, I think about the Simpsons thing of Mendoza every single time. I swear to God. And MSK, which we still don't know what it stands for. Nash Carter and Wesley. 
Wesley and Nash Carter won the Dusty Rhodes Tag Team Classic. Grizzled Young Veterans were the runners up for the second year in a row. And Legato Don Fantasma is just awesome. So they just get in there because why not? I am a fan of all three of these teams. I think that if any of them wins, I'm going to be happy. So not only do I think that the match is going to be good, but I can't imagine a scenario where I'm disappointed afterward. I'm really looking forward to that. And I'm leaning a little bit more towards MSK. But to be honest, there's a part of me that says, you know what? I don't know if they're going to fully give them the titles. They might go with veterans just to give MSK somebody to chase a little bit or something. Uh, less so for NXT and more for Mania, but since it's Mania week, I'll group this philosophy together. I think baby faces should sweep almost everything this week. So I'd like to see MSK win. However, I am not sold like much like Tony. I'm not sold. So I'm going to say final prediction gun to my head. Grizzled Young Veterans, but this match should fucking rule. God, they're all good, aren't they? They're just... Well, look at Del Fantasma. I haven't seen much of their teamwork, but Grizzled Young Vets and MSK, I'd like to watch again and again and again. So I'm excited for this. I think this obviously will be a very exciting triple threat tag team match. All teams involved are great. They do a lot of fun stuff together. The match between MSK and Grizzled Young Veterans from the previous takeover was, again, another one in the pantheon of awesome tag team matches we've seen from NXT over the years. I really think only Lorcan should be in this match. How so? I think he should be defending it on his own. Should Pete Dunne have teamed with only Lorcan? No, I think I think only Lorcan should be defending the titles on his own. I'd have been okay with either of those scenarios, because... Lorkin's a madman. He could have just been of, like, you know, no, 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 I'm going to just do it on my own. Like, that would have been cool. Honestly, it kind of pisses me off that he's not in this match. Because I know, obviously, his partner got injured and there's nothing in control about that. But he's now completely left out of a takeover that he should really be part of. And that's and it's true to no fault of his own. In fact, the person who it is kind of the fault of is wrestling in the main event of the second night. But again, that's just how wrestling works. So I would like to have seen him involved in this in some fashion, but it, as he's not, I think, and I, and he wouldn't have won it anyway. I mean, he was just going to be in the match, just being a madman to try and defend his championships. It would turn him baby face, and then you'd just give the title to someone else instead. I think I'm going to go with the safe bet of going with MSK. I think they were the ones that were initially going to be facing against, I guess, presumably... The only reason that they didn't win the tag team titles yet or aren't just fighting uh, Lorcan and Birch straight up for the tag team titles on this show is because one of the... Uh, I can't remember which one of the two, but one of them got their hand injured. I think it was Wesley, right? Yeah, I and so, so it had to be out of action for a little while. So that's the only reason that this... They continued the feud with Gristle with Young Veterans, so I feel like the, the plan in the long term was to give MSK the title, so I think that's what they're going to do here. Yeah, I mean, they did give them the cup, so more than likely, that's where they were heading. I mean, sometimes we've had some swerves, especially with, like, the women's tag team titles, but, like, it's hard to go against what seems like the direction that they were heading in. Yet, in the past, we've seen plenty of situations where it's been like, okay, well, they're clearly heading in this kind of direction, and then they go, you know what? But something changed, so screw it. We're going to go in the opposite direction just because now things have changed. So it wouldn't shock me if they just suddenly went with Legato do Fantasma or something, and then MSK was fighting for the titles. But even that would be a little bit disappointing because if MSK was told, all right, the plan is you're going to win the Dusty Rhodes Tag Team Classic, and that's going to be this ma massive push, and then you're going to get the uh, the, the wrestle looking at Birch and win the tag team titles down the line. And then they just go, well, we decided to go in a different direction. Then that kind of is a little bit upsetting, too. So, yeah, I'm going to go MSK. But if either of the two other teams win, not only will I be totally fine with that because I'm a fan, but I also won't be too like, whoa, what? You know, kind of a reaction to that. And I do think that this is going to start off the card. I think that that's a great way to just kind of kick things off is like 
we got a title match. We got uh, six talented people. New champions are going to be crowned. Stay tuned for the rest of the night, everybody. This is going to be a wild ride sort of thing. Now, yeah, makes sense for it to after that, if they want to transition over to something that, depending on like when they need commercial breaks or if they're just going to take that during the matches themselves, I'm assuming that that's probably going to be the case, right? I don't imagine so. So maybe they don't need to have like a buffer match, but maybe they do. I think we're going into the Gauntlet Eliminator. That way we've got multiple. Actually, you know what? I'm I'm blanking on this. Did they say every three minutes? Somebody uh, yeah, new comes so, in? Yeah, so it'll be, it'll be two people that start off the match, and then it'll be every single three minutes a new competitor enters the match. Okay, so it's not like a um, true gauntlet of you got to beat the person and then the next person comes no, out kind of a thing. That's is, right, yeah. This is akin to um, Aztec Warfare in Lucha Underground. I haven't seen it. You it's should. a Royal Rumble. Wait, with pins. Royal Rumble <laughs> via pinball submission. Yeah. They really seem to like this Eliminator name in both WWE and AEW recently. Do you guys notice that? Well, I know that AEW has been... like That's just their new phrase for whenever anybody goes up against a champion or whenever they're doing a tournament that's single elimination, which makes sense. It's an Eliminator. And if it works for NXT, great. I hope this becomes a, a signature match for them without the wacky battle royal that precedes it. Yeah, I'm not a big fan of the way that the battle royal went down with, let's take, what was it, like four people out of the match and that was it? It was something like that. Uh, it was a, it wasn't it a 12-man battle royal? So well, it was, card got eliminated. it was 11. Because of oh, yeah. um, Roderick Strong eliminated himself ahead of time. And then the, it was what? Tyler Rust, Jake Atlas, Kushida, Pete Dunne. Who's the other one? Um, Austin, uh, Austin Theory was in it. Austin Theory. Oh, I do remember that one. Because that I really liked his elimination. Where <laughs> That's right. Because you usually hate the whole, oh, he got a feet touch the floor. And then he just duped himself. Oh, I like the feet touch the floor type of thing. Oh, did I get you confused with Sean? I'm sorry. Yeah, I I like it when they do the whole, you know, something and switch things up and Kofi Kingston is still in the match or something. But I like that because he's an idiot character that he's just kind of like, oh, I know how I'll get on back on my feet kind of thing. He's like, yeah, I did it. And they're like, you're gone. And he's like, what? Shit. <laughs> kind of like, so that was great. Um yeah, I don't like the whole, well, then you get to the last couple people. But then again, you know what? I've seen plenty of worse options like that. So I'm okay if they keep that going forward, if they've got enough people and if they can figure out a way to make it interesting. But we know the entry order for this is going to be Leon Ruff, Isaiah Swerve Scott. Then eventually, three minutes later, Bronson Reed's going to come in. Then we got Cameron Grimes. Then uh, Dexter Loomis and then L.A. Knight. And the winner of this match is going to go on to night two to face Johnny Gargano for the North American Championship. I I think we can rule out a couple people just on principle alone. I think you can rule out almost everybody. I think, obviously, Leon Ruff has had his time as North American Champion and fighting for the title and fighting Gargano. I can't imagine any scenario where Swerve Scott wins because not only is he a heel, but he's also just not got a whole lot of momentum on his side. And he's starting off. Cameron Grimes, as great as he is, again, he's a heel and he's better off when he loses. Then he could just be, you know, doing a tantrum and just being like, yeah, I'm Cameron Grimes. What the fuck? You don't do this. And he kiss my grits. And it's basically Bronson Reed and Dexter Loomis because. Even though they teased LA Knight versus Gargano, I think the reason why they did that was to try to make it seem like he didn't just have the whole, well, he's a heel, he's not going to win stigma around him. So it's just, do they give it to Bronson Reed or do they give it to Loomis? And Loomis is the one that's been feuding directly with Gargano. So this might just be a roundabout way to get the match that seemed like we were going to get a month ago. Yeah. Uh, So we need to talk about, in several matches... And we've said this, I feel like, for the last 20 takeovers. But 
Gargano, Cole, Champa really need to go or something. Like, I fully expect Gargano to lose the belt here, and it will be to Loomis because that's where they're going anyway. And I, I don't know what Gargano does. And, like, yeah, you can make the argument of you don't have a conversation of moving somebody off a brand every time Dolph Ziggler loses or any time, every time something like that happens. But at the end of the day, the point of NXT is to move the talent to Raw and SmackDown. And I really think they missed a great opportunity while there was no touring to at least flirt with Gargano and Ciampa and Undisputed Era on Raw or SmackDown. Now it's like, if Johnny loses, and God forbid Candice and Indy lose, what do they do? Because I feel like they've done everything there is to do. And on top of that, I'm not stoked on the idea of Loomis, but he has to win the belt here. That feels like the right course of action. So I can't really say I'm going to be thrilled with the outcome, but I am looking forward to seeing if they choose to go in a different direction afterwards. I actually agree, disagree, but I'm going to let Callum go first. <laughs> no, I, I kind of disagree as well, so I was going to get to that point as well. Um, I disagree with the fact that I don't want... As I, say, I don't want them to move to the main roster because obviously they'll get... They'll just will be ricochet on the main roster. They'll just be pushed for a month and then they'll be down in the lower reaches because they're small guys. And we all know that's going to happen, so that's why I don't really want it to happen. I uh, also don't want. I also have issue now with the idea that NXT isn't just to move people up to the main roster, because it has its own TV show now on the USA Network, which means that it's a brand. And so it does. It's its purpose now is to get ratings. It's not to promote people to the main roster. I um, guess. Well, well, at least when it was fighting AEW, it might change a little bit now that it's just its own night, but. At the end of the day, it is there to attract ratings now. It's a TV show. It's getting paid to be a TV show to attract ratings. Right. It's no longer just a, a tool to get people primed to go onto the main roster. As for this match, I feel, it, as Tony said, it's going to come down to your Bronson Reed or Dexter Loomis. They'll go with Bronson Reed if they want to have a good match. They'll go with Dexter Loomis if they want to follow the story that they've been telling. It's the issue that Dexter Lewis, I don't think he's bad. He's not bad in the ring. I'll say that much. He's bad as a character. His character makes absolutely zero sense as a, as a baby face. But I think if he's the one that wins the Gauntlet in Eliminator, then this whole Johnny Takeover reputation is going to be tested to its absolute limits in a way that it never probably has before at a Takeover. And if, Gon if Gargano can have a match with Dexter Lewis that is. Oh, again, I know everyone talks about like, the quote-unquote star scale or anything like that, but if it's anywhere being like a great match, a, a 7 or 8 out of 10, then he's then that reputation stays intact. And if not, then it is Loomis's fault and not Gargano's. I think that they will go with the story and they will have Dexter Loomis because for some reason a lot of people seem to be behind the scenes, from what we've heard, are very high on Dexter Loomis as a character. So They're super I, high on characters right now. Yeah. Like Tiana Cameron Grimes is a character as well. Like, legitimately, Dexter Loomis is probably, I'd say, the fifth person that I'd want to see win this match. And the guy and the guy that I would least want to see win this match is the guy that's coming in after him. Because really? LA Knight, <laughs> oh, LA Knight's a joke already. Like, oh, yeah. Who cares about LA Knight, really? When you have him lose to Bronson Reed, and I like Bronson Reed, but when you have him lose to Bronson on night one, oh, you suck. Yeah, well, it, well, obviously it was it was night two for him, but at, at the very least, it's just a case of I just don't see what he brings to the table. Like he's a good talker, so so what? You're being scripted all the time. So you, essentially, his ability as a promo t worker is pretty much nerfed by the fact that he's going to be scripted constantly. And he's not actually that good in the ring. I mean, he's just I I would class him as quote unquote serviceable. He's... That's probably the term that I would give to him. 
I feel like he's good in a way that n- no longer requires... Like, it's no longer needed. And he's way too old to be with, to be in NXT. I mean, obviously, everyone in WWE is way too old. They sign people way too old. But he's 38 years old. He's not going to be someone who's going to, oh, this is the type of person that will be in NXT, and then he'll be shot up to the main roster, and he'll be fighting for title soon and stuff like that. No, he's there to be a facilitator. He should be... And they did this with EC3, and they were fucking miserable with it. But that doesn't change the fact that Eli Drake, LA Knight, should go directly to the main roster. He's as main roster ready, whatever that means in 2021, as you can be. He was an Impact World Champion. He wrestles in old school style. At this point, he's a bigger guy by comparison to some. And I think he should just be on the main roster. That being said, I think no matter where he is, no matter what brand, his goal is to help others be elevated. And I don't see him doing anything but taking that cash his own role. Yeah, I think yeah. that's where he's at here. So that's another reason why I don't think that he stands much of a chance to win this. Yeah. He's one of the most bizarre signings that I've seen WWE make recently, just due to the fact that he's probably someone they have to pay a decent amount because he does have name value, but he doesn't have enough name value to, for it to be worth anything. So that no one's actually tuning into it's like, oh, what, Eli Drake is now performing in NXT? I better check that out. Like, no one is. Like, nobody has ever said that phrase. Um, I'm yeah, not as down I, on him. I'm not, I'm, not, I mean, I'm not down on him as, like, just a, a personality. I just don't see the point, really. But he'd be perfect to be still in the NWA or back in Impact, something like that, because he does have a great deal of charisma and he is a good wrestler. I just don't feel like he needs to. It's like someone was like, "Why are you here of all places? You could be in so many other places, making more of a difference and being more of a bigger star, and yet you're here." I feel that with certain people, both in WWE and outside WWE, that just don't really fit the promotion they're with right now. But, he seems to me like he needs a tag team partner. Yeah, he needs a, he needs a tag team partner, or, or actually, I feel like he's someone that should be a mouthpiece for someone else. He could be like an occasional wrestler, like MVP is, but he should be more as a a character helping someone who's not as good in the mic get over. Like I can see him when he when uh, he comes back to be teamed with um, oh, what's that guy's name? The um uh, the, Bri- the, the British guy that got injured in the match with Gargano, Rich Holland. Rich Holland, yeah, that's it. Yeah, yeah, he, I can see that pairing. Yeah, I think that would probably work to help get Rich Holland over. But gun to my head for this match, I would say Dexter Loomis is going to win the Gauntlet Eliminator, and we'll talk about the title match later. Yeah, I think that Loomis is winning this. I think that they're going to have Bronson Reed beat. Well, I'm assuming Scott beats Ruff. Reed beats Scott, Reed beats Grimes as well, and then it's Reed and Loomis, but the fact that Reed already just beat two other people means that well, he goes in to Loomis a little like, uh, oh wait, no, that's not Gauntlet yeah, yeah, style. Yeah. Gauntlet yeah, I'm forgetting about sure. that. So yeah, so they don't need to do it. At this point. Yeah, they could just end up being like uh, Reed and Grimes and Loomis and Knight all I, in the same thing or something. That's right. My belief of this one is that Bronson Reed is going to eliminate at least three people in this match. Yeah, he'll probably be the one that stands out the most, and Loomis will just happen to be the one that wins at the end. So yeah. they might actually, you know what the setup is probably? Ruff and Scott fight each other. Reed comes in. Reed either resets the table, or maybe by that point, one of them is eliminated. And then you get Grimes, and you get Loomis, and you get Knight. And Knight... Second to last is probably the one who eliminates Reed and then Loomis beats Knight. That makes most sense. So then... Loomis needs to be Grimes, though. It should come down to Grimes and Loomis. I'm and still Loomis hoping that they do something with Ted DiBiase. I don't think that not they will, tonight. but... Not tonight. Not uh, Wednesday night, at least. I I would well, love I'm... to see some kind of a backstage skit where he just tries to like pay his way into getting the North American championship match to be a triple threat by trying to like, you know, Hey, I'm going to pay you off and you know, you'll do that. And then it's like Ted DiBiase's backstage or, you know, like something like that. Cause he's been doing this whole like, God damn you Ted DiBiase kind of thing. <laughs> I mean, really how I'd like this match to go is you have Leon Ruff and Isaiah Swerve, Scott Starr, and you have them just 
go balls to the wall crazy for the three minutes that they're out there together. Just do as many cool things you possibly can together. Get Bron to read out. He eliminates both of them before the three minutes is over. Then Cameron Grimes comes out. He tries to pay off Bronson Reed to basically eliminate himself. And he has plans to do that with the other guys as well. Bronson Reed just rips up his money and eliminates Grimes. And then you're just left with him and Dexter Loomis brawling for a while because they're two of the bigger dudes in the match. Then MA Knight gets involved and essentially you're only down to the final three doing stuff for a while. Yeah. So I think I think you should use this as an opportunity. If I, what, if I was you doing this match, I would use this as an opportunity to get readers over as possible. Because mm-hmm. see, out of all of them, obviously Cram Grimes is a great character, an awesome character, and I'm not taking anything away from him in that regards. But the guy who has the most star power out of these six going forward, I think, is Bronson. And for that matter, that's why I think that Loomis isn't winning the championship. And we'll just skip tonight, too, because we're doing this all in one shot, so we might as well. We don't need to follow the actual pattern. I think that Loomis loses the match to Gargano, whether it's by hook or by crook, either Austin Theory or Indy Hartwell or Candice LeRae or all three of them or whatever get into the mix, or somebody else actually helps out Johnny. Like, maybe starts a brand new feud with Dexter Loomis going forward. I don't know who that would necessarily be, but some way and in some fashion, I think Loomis comes up short and Gargano retains. And if anybody's going to beat him for it right now, I'm leaning more towards Bronson Reed. I think we got enough title changes that are going to be happening and a couple guaranteed title changes at the very least that we don't need Gargano to all lose as well. Also, I think that that's going to factor into the tag team title match, but we'll get to that. We'll get to night two. So, so, so I think. Oh, go ahead. You want to get, you, okay, I think that uh, Loomis is winning the North American Championship against Johnny Gargano, and I think he's doing it because Indy Hartwell was going to cost Johnny Gargano. Yeah, and I agree with Calvin. I think that's I a red I, herring. No, I, I think that I don't think it's going to be intentional. I think she's just going to uh, essentially be outside. I'm not. I'm saying like she just trips Gargano up d- directly to help Loomis. I think she just gets distracted with the whole Loomis crush thing that distracts Gargano, and Gargano says, "What the hell are you doing?" That type of thing, and then he walks into Loomis. Loomis takes him out, chokes him out, and wins the match that way. And that's how you start facilitating the breakup of the way as a unit. Uh, I really hope that that's not yeah, the case. Like, well, not, well, they only got together, what was it, like, um, October time? Yeah, Halloween Havoc. Uh, no, it was yeah. Ha- yeah, Halloween Havoc, yeah. And I think that's enough. I, I mean, I mean, they're not they're not going to... It's not like they're going to break up immediately afterwards, but you need to start facilitating this thing. Because at, at the end of the day, it really is hurt. I think, even though a lot of their segments they're doing are fun, funny, I think it's hurting all four of them more than it's helping any of them. I mean, the only people that it has the potential to help really are Austin Fury and Indy Hartwell. And it only helps them if they are the ones to dispose of Candice LeRae and Johnny Gargano. See, that's where I think that we might get that down the line in some fashion. And that's why I I don't think that they're going to be broken up yet. I I think it's an inevitability. Whether it happens here or it starts happening like months and months down the road, it has to happen. But I feel like that's what they're going to start off doing now because if if Rob is right and you need to start moving people to the main roster, then you need to start breaking these this unit up pre- pretty quickly. So, so, so we got what... two going for Loomis winning the title, and I'm sticking with Gargano uh, retaining. So, yeah. Yep. So uh, another one that I think is where the title's not going anywhere is the NXT UK Championship because Walter is defending against Tommaso Ciampa, but he's also defending the title the next day at NXT UK Prelude against Rampage Brown, which means even though they recorded it ahead of time, the fact that it airs afterward and the fact that they didn't specify that it's been recorded ahead of time means that they're treating it as if it's not. And if they're going to treat it like the commentators are going to talk about it on Prelude as... Well, you saw that match that Walter had last night against Tommaso Ciampa. That was a brutal match. Where I re- then Walter well, has to retain do the title. That, per se, they've done I it mean, before. Yeah, they, yeah, they can, they can do that. But that's so silly. It's not like the man hopped on a whatever. That's what I mean, they it... are going to treat it as, though. Like they, 
they've done that plenty of times in the past where they've recorded like those old episodes of NXT, remember? Where they record like 10 in a row. And then they'd be like, you saw what just happened uh, last week. And it's like, no, that was like eight minutes ago for when you recorded right, it. Right, yeah. but I feel like that's different because you're in the same space instead of being like, all right, you know for a fact this is a completely different continent. You know? I mean, it's still only like, what was it, six to eight hours to travel between the two of them. So it's not like it's unrealistic that he'd go from the USA back to the UK and defend his championship. I guess Florida would love and to have and, so. and as far as I'm aware, there's no COVID restrictions between the UK and the USA. Beyond right. just like checking that's checking that this stuff has happened and like he'll just well, we know that it's been recorded in advance anyway, so it doesn't really matter. But I don't think realism is the real thing that they need to worry about too much at this point. I All kind we know of is, wish oh, that yeah. even though obviously Balor is doing something big the next night with Cross, that they just would have been like, all right, for night one, here's a Worlds Collide exhibition match between Balor and Walter, just because the dead giveaway of the title being on the line takes you out of it in the sense of, you know, Ciampa's not going to win, whereas if it was just a match, you could think, well, I could see Ciampa giving him hell and maybe squeaking out the win. I think they're holding off on Balor Walter for when they've got fans in the UK and Balor can go over there. Yeah, and I understand that, and that's probably the best move for them. But I think this match should be a lot of fun. It should be hard hitting as well. Yeah, uh, they should beat the shit out of each other. <laughs> it's one of the ones I wish was on Thursday, so I could fully uh, focus on the takeover card, but. I think this will be one of the better matches on night one and Walter's got to win probably with like a power bomb or something. Oh, I think this is, there's a good amount of potential. That this is the best match of the entire week. It's got a shot. It's got a Cause, good shot. Cause Walter is just awesome to watch. Just everything he does is so real because it is basically real. He's he's just literally murdering people in the ring constantly. And Chumper is going to take it because Chumper is crazy. And we'll do all that stuff and he'll fire back with just amount, as much force. I think that Water is obviously going to retain. There's really no debate about that. The more interesting thing is what is Tim Timothy Thatcher's involvement in all this? It's a point I wanted to bring up because we haven't seen Thatcher and it seemed like they were heading in a direction that they wanted to go in and maybe things changed because of COVID and we know that there was an outbreak. So we didn't see either Thatcher or Alexander Wolf, but they could have gone in, you know, a bunch of different ways. Like uh, they've teased the idea that Imperium wants Thatcher. And if Imperium's going to hang around in NXT rather than NXT UK for a while, I don't think Walter's going to. He might, and maybe that's going to factor into our predictions when it came to Rampage Brown. He could drop that title to Rampage Brown. I don't think it's going to happen, but it could happen. What do happen. you think, Callum? you think Rampage Brown has a shot? He definitely has more of a shot than Chomper does. Oh, yeah. Um, well, yeah, that's pretty obvious anyway. But um, I don't think it's out of the question that Rampage was to, were to win that one because he's a guy that has the size to match up to Walter at the very least. I think it would be a mistake. I really think that the guys who beat Walter should be Tyler Bay. I just think I, wouldn't, they, I wouldn't be against it. I just think they built him up as an underdog character too much and done too many feuds with him on NXT UK with basically everyone else you can do a feud with on the NXT UK roster that you have to give him the title shot eventually. And it makes more sense of him being like the underdog against the Giants. And I've seen a lot of Walter and T Tyler Bay matches and they're all, always awesome. So I'd like to see that be the approach they take instead. But it wouldn't be out of the question if he were to lose that and then maybe stay in the US for a little while. But Walters always seemed to be very against the idea of working from the US. Mm -hmm. So that makes so, me think even more so that Walter is not sticking around. And but, if Imperium does stick around, they might bring Thatcher in to kind of replace Walter in some ways and be sort of like... The U.S. leader. Yeah, kind of like the, the U.S. representation for that side of things. And then whenever they go over to the U.K., then Walter's the real man in charge. It just happens to be that 
you need a fourth guy in America so Thatcher works out. Yeah, I, I, I can definitely see that happening. Sorry, go ahead. What was that, Rob? I didn't want to say it. I felt like I interrupted him and just thrown him into silence completely. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe you have everything muted or something, Rob. I don't know. Yeah. I think the, the Wi Fi is doing the thing again. Oh, uh, yeah. Me? Little transformer yeah. there. So that's what it was. Oh, <laughs> okay. Wow. You're back now. That's fine. Okay. <laughs> um, yeah, I think that Walter had said that he's open to travel for the first time. So I'm like, I think they want him in the U.S. because he's a bigger drawer in the U.S. Well, it doesn't matter if he's a draw if there's no people. Well, yeah, you're right. I don't know what I'm saying. Well, uh, I mean, there are still ratings, so, you know, I mean, maybe. But I, I just feel like it's it makes more sense for me that Thatcher would just screw Chumper over and become the uh, representative because he's better as a heel anyway. He doesn't really work as a baby face, I don't think. The only thing that I find slightly off about that is it means that we'll have another feud between Thatcher and Ciampa only a couple of months after their last feud. Maybe that'll be one of those things that they only have a blow-off match, though. Maybe it's just sort of one more, and then you're done, and then Imperium moves on to feud with somebody else. Like, they start going for the tag titles or something, you know? Well, unless Rob's thoughts come into fruition, and this is t- this is the match that's going to write off Ciampa. That could be. You know, I mean, send him to the main roster. If he doesn't get written off at some point, to just I mean, well, I don't know. They can go to like I'm using that phrase a lot today. They can go in a lot of different directions. That's the phrase for the day. Um, they can do a lot of things here. Where maybe Ciampa does come up after WrestleMania, and he's already had big blow off matches with Adam Cole and with Johnny Gargano. So you don't have to do. Gargano Cole is the last, uh, or Gargano Champa is the last match that Champa has in NXT before moving up. Plus, maybe he's the guy that feuds with Randy Orton going forward or something. They did tease that quite a bit in the past, so I wouldn't be opposed to the idea. I think that Champa, at this point in his career, he needs to go to the main roster. He needs to go to Monday Night Raw. He needs to be a, a mid Carter to start off on Raw. And in that upper mid card kind of scene, I mean, I'd be fine with him going to SmackDown too. Like it's not like it's raw or nothing, but I want Walter and Champa to just have a brutal match and to do their thing. And then I'll I'll worry a little bit more about where they go with Champa after that. But I do think that it's a guarantee 100%. The easiest match to call on this entire card is that Walter wins. So then we got Kushida against Pete Dunne, a match that I did not anticipate being on this card because it seemed like, well, if you know that they don't win the uh, gauntlet spots, then that's it. And not only did I think that that was not going to factor in and I didn't expect them to be like, well, there they go. They're out of the match and they're having a match on their own, which was kind of just weird. But I also just don't get the feeling that Kushida is at all the person that they were building toward with this idea that Pete Dunne wants to challenge somebody to prove that he's the best in-ring technician. And I get this feeling that Kushida is kind of the backup option. I don't know at all if this is what is true. This is pure speculation on my uh, part. So don't even take this with a grain of salt. Just don't even really take it for the most part. But I feel like they had a better, bigger name in mind and plans fell through. And then they decided, you know what? We got to do something for this. So maybe down the line, they're going to revisit this and Pete Dunne's going to beat Kushida here and say, see, I'm proving it. I'm the best in-ring technician. And then somebody else on just an episode of NXT, maybe even the week, afterward maybe as a means to try to get people to tune in to tuesday it might just be like wow this person came in they're going to challenge pete dunn and whatever i'm starting to think that that's like i'm gonna put the tinfoil hat on that's where i'm going so 100 percent pete dunn has to win this match unless the game plan the whole time was kushida and beating pete dunn is the way to get him propelled into some like Cruiserweight Championship match or something. I don't know. But I'm leaning much, much towards Pete Dunne 
and that this actually was not the match that they were originally going to go with. So this um, person that you thought that Pete Dunne was going to be facing, is he in one of the main events of the WrestleMania card? Maybe, because Daniel Bryan is the one that makes the most sense. Yes, that was the one that I obviously posited a little while ago. Um, from what I'd heard from some other people talking about it, and it felt like it was the one that made the most sense to me. But I also think and, it could just be somebody that's not even in the company right now. It seems like it'd be a big tease to to do that and then just not have them lined up yet. Well, I mean, it could be somebody who's lined could up. Be. It could just be that they decided that, you know what, we got enough going on for a takeover. Let's hold that off for the Tuesday afterward because they'll need something of a hook. But, but who could that be? That's where I'm completely uh, unaware of because I didn't even expect like the Eli Drake thing and I don't know who really is available and who isn't and I don't know maybe they signed somebody from like the Impact and NWA and New Japan and whatever Spectrum or maybe there's somebody just on the indies that I'm unaware of because I mean when Adam Cole came in people are like oh my god Adam Cole's there and I'm like who's this dude he looks like Billy Baldwin yeah. Like, you know, kind of a thing. Like, I'm not the type of person who knows the indie people that uh, can come in and be that kind of a name. I I would say, but when you're talking about, like, with the way that Pete Dunne was talking about the best technicians, and he's proven to be the best technical wrestler, the only people from outside of WWE that I could see coming in for that role would be Zack Sabre Jr. or Jonathan Gresham. And neither of them is coming to WWE. Gresham Sorry. would be good in a fantasy world, like be a great match. Uh, Saber Jr. was in the Cruiserweight Classic, but I can't see him coming back. And he's obviously a New Japan and all that. Uh, when Callum mentioned Daniel Bryan a couple weeks ago, I just immediately was like, that's the match I want to see. Obviously, Bryan has ended up factoring in big time the WrestleMania, so he can't do that. This definitely feels like the last minute option, and that's their fault because it could feel like this is awesome and this is badass, but Kushida feels like a last minute option because of how they book Kushida. Mm -hmm. And hopefully this is that match that puts Kushida back on the map, but right now I can't see anything but Pete Dunne wins and they set up bigger things for him in the future. Yeah, I, I mean, I think that this match will be very good because the two people involved, yeah. it is hard to be super excited about it. Just as Rob says, they've booked Kushida. It's it's weird because they booked Kushida really well for a while, like he was winning constantly. And then he lost that match to Gargano and then he basically didn't matter anymore. It's like, okay, you had, your, you had the title match that we were building you up with like six months of going undefeated for... And then you lost it, and now we don't care about you. Go to the back of the line. Not even go to the back of the line, just disappear. Just go away. Don't want you anymore. <laughs> just like, we'll, we'll call on you every now and again, but like we don't really actually need you here anymore. I um, hope that the move to Tuesdays allows them to bunker down and start getting back to the NXT of old now that there will be no competition aspect. Yeah. I mean, I think that he'll be slotted back into the Cruiserweight picture mm-hmm. after this. But I feel because of that, Pete Dunne is somebody that they could actually position more into the main event moving forward. So I think Pete Dunne is the most likely winner of this match. Uh, it's a hat trick then, all going for Pete Dunne. I think that's one of the easier ones to predict as well. And also, I think uh, probably one of the more easier ones to predict is Raquel Gonzalez beating Io Shirai for that NXT Women's Championship. And I will give you guys credit. When we were talking about Io Shirai dropping the title over the course of the past couple of months, you guys were holding strong that Raquel Gonzalez needs to be the one that beats her for the title. And I was like, well, they did the match. I think that they just pushed that off to the side already. I thought for sure Tony Storm was going to be the one. And they came back around. So Raquel is in that position again. She's even uh, in an even better position than she was before because... They gave her and uh, Dakota Kai that women's tag team title thing that I was like, oh, they're going in that direction instead and immediately had them drop it. So that was like, okay, you're having her lose those titles because you know that she's going to win the other title and you don't want to have her holding two belts. 
Io Shirai's dropping that. She's held it for like a year. I'm excited yeah. for the match too. I think that they are like uh they're railing on each other quite a bit. They're they're gonna do the very best that they can to make that main event seem like we earned this and I don't want any criticism afterward, kind of a thing. This is gonna be a very intriguing match because of the dynamics of the two wrestlers involved. Because Raquel is, has looked really good the past year in terms of just her in work. She's improving a lot, but she still has some way to go. But she has an immense amount of power and size and presence that really stands out. Whereas EO has been beating everybody left, right and center. But she's smaller. She's quicker. She's does more aerial stuff. So it's going to be a bit of a juxtaposition between the two superstars. And I'm hoping that that blends well. I hope they have good chemistry together. And I'm excited for the match. I think that they will go pretty hard on each other and they'll know that they're the main events they're going to want to deliver, especially because somewhere in the night previous, prior to them is going to be Water versus Tom, Tommaso Ciampa. And they're going to have to do a hell of a lot to get match of the night over those two. Having yeah. Said that, yeah. Having said that, okay. it's very predictable that Raquel Gonzalez has got to win this one. I, I love Dio as champion, and I think that she's done a really good job with that title belt throughout this entire year. They've given her plenty of things to do. And it's not like she's been in the most like active stories throughout the entire thing, but she's had good matches throughout. She's held onto the championship. She's faced every uh, contender that's come up against her. And now's the right time for to use that prestige that she's built into the belt through her strong title reign and pass it on to someone who can take it from there. And Raquel's the right choice for that. Partially because of the way the year has been, I can't believe she's been champion for nearly a year. But she's had a good run with the belt. Maybe one of the best babyface runs with the belt ever. Maybe the best. I mean, I would argue Asuka and then Io. Yeah, and even and Asuka, then... towards the end there, they were booking her as more of like a heel, heel at least tweener. Yeah. And Raquel's the right person to take it. I'm a little concerned with this division because it seems like they only know how to book two stories and they're about to enter their uh, dominant heel champion. I think uh, Saray is going to take it from her once they get her into the fold. In the meantime, she can wrestle like Zoe Stark, who's done really good, and uh, Zeta Ramir. And they have people coming in that can do a really good job, but I think ultimately it will be for Saray to take it. And I like Raquel. Raquel is great. The partnership with Dakota has been great. Came a long way in the last year, let alone when she was Reina Gonzalez, yeah. the May Young Classic. Uh, kudos to her. She deserves this moment. I hope they steal it. And by the way, main roster... That's how you book two nights of a card. It's not even a question whether or not the women are headlining the first night because they are that good. They could have been assholes and put Adam Cole and Kyle O'Reilly on night one, you know? Like, But no, the right people are headlining here because the women do deserve it. And kudos to NXT for that, and Raquel wins. If I was to do a bit of um, forward-thinking fantasy booking with... Raquel Gonzalez's title, and I know that's probably something that you'd save more for the post show because we don't even know if Raquel's going to win yet. But um, I would like to see her. Obviously, she'll start as a heel champion, but I think that she should turn babyface halfway through because Dakota Kai turns on her. I could see that. I think and... Shawn Michaels and Triple H are actively, or at least Shawn, mm. would actively vocally be against that because he was not a fan of. Uh, being the heel to uh, Diesel's baby face. That, I mean, that, that's true, but I think Raquel has built up a bit of the groundswell of support among people, that some people are actively rooting for her in this match against Dio Shirai. And I think they should use that momentum and make her a baby face, and then she should drop the title to Zoya Lee. It all depends on who she's going to drop that belt to, because if she drops yeah. it to somebody like Zaya, then she needs to turn face. But if she drops it to, like, Shotzi then she stays heel full-blown. 
yeah and i feel i feel this is an opportunity to go in i don't say a different direction but to use some of the people that haven't been featured towards the main event for a little while in the next t's women's division and try and use these new signings like what was the we know ty valkyrie's coming in yeah and i assume ty valkyrie is going to be heel because no one has a fluffy pink a fluffy dog alongside them is baby face so. right but there's no way that dog doesn't immediately turn her baby face Although they've been treating the dog like it's baby face because it's a dog. Well, we don't even know if the dog is the actual person, is the actual character that's coming in and tied to Frankie. Just a hammer. Instead. I would be very on board with the dog wrestling. Well, they It'd apparently like that, trademarked uh, Frankie Monet, so I'm assuming that that's that Ty like Valkyrie's that's name. Her name, yeah. Like, yeah. And a dog, I don't know. Dog will be a uh, Rex. <laughs> And it just seems so weird that they're not doing anything that links it to Morrison. Maybe they just don't want the two to be any kind of a pairing, because that way they can have Morrison do his own thing on Raw, you know? I I don't know much of anything, but my guess would be Taya would want to be her own woman. Oh, yeah, I'm I'm not saying that um, I'm totally against it. It just feels a bit odd to me, because... I was kind of one of the people in the camp that said that she shouldn't go to NXT in the first place. She should go to the main roster and team with them. Or at least I be think, connected to them. I think it's... Uh, WWE is back in this weird phase of, like, we've got to own fucking everything. And everybody's changing their names. And we've got to own it all. And because of that alone, you can't even bump her up to the main roster. And just be like, oh, Ty Valkyrie, you know who she is, longest running knockouts champion. Nope, they're gonna be like, here's Frankie Monet from NXT, and she's John Morris's wife. In like they'll do that in like six months. As long as they build up the equity of the Frankie Monet name and character. Well WWE's gonna find out that uh, they can't own everything. Because at the very least we know that James Bond owns space. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> check out the Review to a Kill podcast, everyone, over on fanboysanonymous.com to check out references to why that's been brought up. And <laughs> when we get to Moonraker, you'll understand that reference and the Omen <laughs> reference that we keep saying. Um, I'm just saying, I'm just saying, we know who's going to win the uh, main event. Yeah. The night one. <laughs> a woman. A woman. A woman. <laughs> So, you go to fanboysanonymous.com, show some love to the blue brand, and uh, you know, subscribe to the YouTube channel. Head up to Patreon for that if you want more fanboys content. Uh, for instance, the Godzilla vs. Kong fan tracks that we did, and also the Mount Rushmore of Batman villains that we did yesterday. Check that out if you're interested in that. And again, of course, I mentioned the Baron Zemo Funko Pop. Do the entrance uh, fees for those. Uh, fees. There's no fees. It's free. Entrance freeze, I should say. You wish there was fees. That'd be great, but then that would defeat the purpose of a giveaway. <laughs> you know? Then it would just be like, here, pay me for this, you know, that kind of thing. But um, yeah, that's uh, it's over on fanboysanonymous.com. And if you are a fan of the James Bond series and you want to get into that and watch those along with us, we do one episode of that a week. Most recent one that was uploaded was the Review to a Kill one, but we're uh, doing those in advance so the most recent one that you guys are able to hear at this point is the spy who loved me and this friday you'll be able to hear everything going forward you know moonraker will be popping up so um let's move over to night two now i don't know where they're gonna go with the first match here i'm leaning more towards the ladder match how do you guys think they're gonna do it I would open with the ladder match. First of all, cruiserweights should open. It's an opening slot on the card. If it's not the ladder, it'll be the North American. But I think it should be the ladder match. And I'm kind of at a toss-up for the ladder match. I'm leaning towards it's the ladder match, women's tag, unsanctioned match, North American title NXT championship. That'd be good. And then closing it out with uh, Cole and O'Reilly. No, that 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 would be the. Oh, the unsanctioned third right? match of the night. You see, I think they're gonna close it. What do you think the lineup's gonna be, Colin? I mean, I don't really care. <laughs> in all honesty it doesn't really matter to me what the order is 
but I would probably go. I mean, if it was me, I'd go with the women's tag match first because I think it's going to be the worst match on the entire uh, two nights. So I'd start with that and try and get it out of the way or give it as much help as possible by making it the opener of the second night. Then I'd go Gog Garno and uh, Loomis. Then the... I, I mean, it's it's odd because I'd, I'd probably go ladder match, title match, and then Cole versus O'Reilly because I just don't think the title match is big enough on its own to be main event. But, so you're much more in the camp of build and get progressively higher. Yeah, I, I'd say for, I understand the rationale of like starting off a really hot match. Like I can totally get it for the first night. You want to start with the tag team title match and get things re- a really, really hot start straight away. I just feel like on night one, you don't have a quote unquote bad match. And I think on night two, you do. Or you have a match that's at least not going to be great. And that's Ember and Shotzi against the way but we'll talk we'll talk about that whichever order why, we're gonna go with why do you think that that won't be great because indy hartwell's in it didn't they kick ass in the uh dusty classic you're not a fan of indy wrestling <laughs> she's not very good she's 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 very green and she essentially this match for me hinges on how long candace stays in the match for not and also Ember Moon and Shotzi are very hit and miss as well. I'm not a fan of that tag team overall. And I guess let's talk about that one. I want the tag team titles to change here. And that actually will factor into the North America. Let's group them together. Because I already gave my prediction for the Gargano thing. We are pretty much kind of talked about that. I think that this ends with the way is holding the tag team titles and the North American title. And even though that's kind of like, well, Moon and Blackheart just won the belts. Well, so did Dakota Kai and Raquel Gonzalez. That didn't stop them. I think they're just sort of fast forwarding. And then the way going forward can be like, well, we're all because they never gave the title to Candace. And they had teased multiple times the idea of Johnny and Candace holding belts at the same time. And this is kind of the way uh, for them to do that, where they don't have to disrupt plans for the belts that they care more about. But I'm still, I've been burned too many times on Candace that I'll see it when I believe it. Even for a belt like this, that is relatively meaningless because it was just randomly announced and they don't even have that many teams on the brand. I'll believe it when I see it, that they actually give something to Candice LeRae. Yes, see, I in terms of linking them together, because I think they are linked. That's the reason why I think Gargano's losing is because I always think the Y is losing. And that's partially due to the fact that Ember and Chops have only just won it. I know, again, they won the titles after a tag team had only held it for like an hour and then passed it on to them. But I think they're the team that they see holding it for a little while. And I think that they're eventually going to lose it to Tian Sha, who are the only other seemingly legitimate tag team they have on the roster. And then... But what will happen is, in my mind, is Indy will be the one that takes the pinfall. Candice will get annoyed about that. They'll start a little bit of a rift between them. Then Indy will get some sort of involvement, uh, in- inadvertently helping Dexter Loomis win the North American Championship. And so she's kind of becomes a scapegoat. Austin Fury stands up t- for her when she's constantly being berated by the other two. And that starts the rift, the divide between them. Go to one side, to the other you eventually have some sort of mixed tag team match, and that's Kicks, Candice, and Johnny uh, Gargano off of NXT and into the main roster. I will say this. I am very glad that they're moving to Tuesdays because I don't get a chance to watch as much NXT as I would like. And because of this, I feel like they just started the way. Yeah, I don't want this to end anytime soon because I also think that Austin Theory is better off and so is Aunt, uh, Indy Hartwell. So if they boot them out or they leave the group on their own accord or anything, I think we're going to get a situation like we get nine times out of ten in WWE where the tag team splits and then nobody has anything to do afterward. And you're like, well, crap, you could have just stayed together. Potentially. I just feel I, I I'm actually kind of in my own mind. Be- feel better off with the way going even if it results in both Fury and Indy Hartwell suffering for it 
because I just I think the way he's a joke act and it's really bringing out the worst in Johnny Gargano. I think Johnny Gargano is a great baby face. That that was his thing. He's a great baby face. Like J- Johnny Takeover, Match of the Night specialist type wrestler, and he's now just a joke heel character. I'm gonna parrot a lot of the things I say about Johnny Gargano on the WrestleMania podcast when I talk about Sami Zayn in that Johnny should be Ricky Steamboat. And he has now shown that he can be a comedy character, so he is fucked for the rest of forever because they're always going to want to see him be a joke. Because he can do it. And I agree with Callum. I just don't see them going in that way. And That way? Yeah. That <laughs> That's way. the new name of the stable. <laughs> That's right. It's the way and that way. Yeah, yeah they'll split uh, and they'll say, say yeah, yeah, they're going, they're this going, way and they're going that way. Yeah. And then it'll be no way. <laughs> That's how he comes yeah. back. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> That's uh, like all they coming back for is just like, oh, you know what? This is over. No way. And then he just goes, oh, say. Okay. And then they're like, all right, you're done. <laughs> you can leave. Go home. <laughs> I'm going with Candace and Indy Winding. Wind, winding. Winding. <laughs> it's uh, Monday morning or afternoon at this point, and I'm already like, all right, I'm tapped out for the week. <laughs> this I'm isn't going to go well. <laughs> I'm going to play it safe and go Shotzi and Ember. Yeah, Shotzi and Ember retain. And uh, I said about Gargano, I think that he retains the North American title in night two. You guys both think that Loomis is winning, right? Yep. Yep. So then we got the ladder match where we're going to unify the NXT Cruiserweight Championship and the NXT Cruiserweight Championship (laughs) because one of them is an interim champion. For anybody who doesn't know what the backstory for this was, Jordan Devlin was the NXT Cruiserweight Champion. He beat Angel Garza on Worlds Collide. And then the pandemic hit, and then they couldn't do anything with that because he was over in the UK, and they weren't filming anything at all for NXT UK for like eight months or whatever it was. So they ran a tournament, and instead of doing what they normally do, where they just strip the champion of the championship and crown a new one, they decided that they were going to make this an interim championship, which they've never done before. And push comes to shove, Devlin retains his title a couple of times when they start going back to being able to record in the BT Sport Studios. Santos Escobar wins that tournament that... It could have been like Drake Maverick. It could have been a couple other people. And Escobar has been retaining his championship as well against people like Kurt Stallion and Shanti the Adonis and, you know, a crop of people over on the brand that nobody watches that should probably just go away after a while. Go away is another one of the stables. And um, I am a huge fan of the fact that they're not only getting around to doing this, but that they're doing the ladder match. I, when Shawn Michaels came out and it was just sort of like, Here's a ladder. There you go. I'm like, oh, that's awesome. Because I'm not the hugest fan of Jordan Devlin. Like, he seems like he's fine. And I know that he'll do a good enough job in the ring. And, like, I'm not worried about that being a problem. But he's not a guy that I'm like, man, I really need to get behind this guy. And I'm really excited for a lot of his matches. I do like Escobar a whole lot. And I'm rooting for Escobar here, not just because I like him better, but I also think it makes the most sense. If you're going to get a championship unified, the interim champion makes the more sense because then you can just transition over. And maybe they'll count Devlin's reign as continuing during that time frame. Maybe they'll say that that officially doesn't matter as much. I don't know. But Devlin's got the NXT UK Heritage Cup that he can go after. And... He can stay over in the UK. Escobar can have this championship in the United States. And that makes the most sense. Plus, it's a ladder match. Legato del Fantasma can interfere. And then uh, Jordan Devlin doesn't look as bad. So I am completely split here because I don't think that Jordan Devlin should win this match. However, I kind of like the idea of both brands just having a cruiserweight gimmick. However, because they have the Heritage Cup, 
maybe they, they don't need this. So safe bet says this goes rightfully on Escobar. D- Jordan Devlin can kind of go away for a while because like people, I'm tired of every time he's on TV, people are like, uh, remember speaking out and he faced no consequences. So like maybe, you know, get the belt off of him here, have him go away for a bit. I don't know. But this should be awesome. The Shawn Michaels, here's a ladder, was my favorite use of a legend in, like, the last five years. <laughs> <laughs> that was... Because it was just so good, and it wasn't forced in any way. It wasn't like, well, we're going to have a ladder match, so let's just randomly bring out a ladder, and I, for some reason, feel like hitting you with this ladder. Now, it's the guy who did it. 20 plus years ago saying here's a ladder you know what to do with it I'll see you later this should be great I'm hopeful that they do the ladder match justice and maybe steal the night it's going to be up against a lot of good competitions I don't think they have it but Escobar should win in a very 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 good wrestling match So this match will be very good, as you can imagine, between two guys involved in it. It's going to be a ladder match. Ladder matches are a bit overdone in today's WWE landscape, but I'm sure it will still be a fun match regardless, especially because it's one-on-one. You don't get to see too many one-on-one ladder matches. Like Most of them involve like somewhere between six to ten people, so it's a bit more interesting when it's one-on-one. You have to tell a bit more of a story uh, throughout the match, so that should be more interesting. I'm kind of over the Cruiserweight Championship as a thing. Like, in a realm where WWE has way too many title belts, this one feels like it's this and the NXT Women's Tag Team titles feel like, yeah, we probably don't need these. Because basically everyone in NXT is a Cruiserweight. So it really doesn't matter that that title exists. And 205 Live doesn't need to exist either. Amen to that, brother. So, realistically... It's they're going to be fighting over a championship that I don't really care about, and it's two people who fundamentally I don't really care about either, because John Devlin hasn't been seen. Obviously, he's been in NXT UK, but he hasn't been over here, and he's just Finn Balor light anyway. So he's not he's, he doesn't really do too much for me. He's a pretty good again. He's a good worker, but most people in NXT are good workers, so it doesn't really matter in that regard. And Sadler Escobar is somebody who. I'd like to think is a great character. And I'd like to think is awesome, but really they don't do anything with Santos Escobar. Like he's just there. He's like, he's held that title since winning the tournament. And then they did the whole beat down angle afterwards. And that's like, okay, that was cool. And then he just was there for ages. And the guards, Del Fantasma were just there. They don't do anything special. The other two are just a, t- a tag team. That's occasionally win matches, occasionally lose matches. They're just a 50, 50 tag team. And he's just held the title against a load of people who realistically just don't have any character or personality. Like him, I'm, I've never been excited with him defending against like, I don't know, Kurt Stallion or mm. even really Swerve Scott because they haven't done much with him either. It's just, it's not his fault. It's the fact they just don't care about the Cruiserweight Championship. Yeah. And so by proxy with him holding the Cruiserweight Championship, it means they don't really care about him either. But maybe they also had a little bit of a. Uh situation where they were like well we don't want to do too much with this because he is the interim champion and whatever too and we don't know where we're going in the future and when we can do that but that's not an excuse for it either yeah i mean if you're gonna if you wanted to take that sort of mindset then you shouldn't have given him you shouldn't have created an interim title you said okay we're just icing the cruiserweight championship until jordan devlin can come back because i yeah i mean i understand again i totally understand why they made an interim champion did everything involved with it i just want them to act like they care about the championship. And realistically, I don't think if Jordan Devlin had been available for all this time, they still wouldn't care about this championship. Yeah. I mean, so, the title went from being its own brand and something that they put a lot of attention to, to being something that was like a bathroom break on Raw, to just being a show that they pre-tape on uh, SmackDown nights. And now it's the Arya Davari and Tony Nese brand. So yeah. it's yeah. really something that they just don't care too much about. 
So overall, I think Thanos Escobar is going to win in a match which I believe will be very good, but I won't really don't really care about the consequences beyond that point either because, yeah, they're just going to be holding a championship that I don't have much interest in. When Kushida gets involved, I might get more interested. I really Kushida hope that they don't go with uh, Devlin and Escobar grabbing a one title apiece. And then saying that they want to split it and make it the NXT UK Cruiserweight Championship, whatever. That's my least favorite scenario. Well, yeah, that'd be that'd be bullshit. And if that's the case, you could have fucking done that from minute one. They didn't. Exactly. That's why I I'm like, don't do it. And we don't need a cruiserweight title in NXT UK either. So, just give it to Escobar. He's the one that's in the states, and Devlin can. I mean, he's had his run, and he's also somebody who could just fight for the Heritage Cup. Why not? Yeah, you know, it's good enough. Arguably better. <laughs> so, you guys want to talk about the unsanctioned match first, or do you want to take care of the uh, NXT title match? Because it seems like NXT you guys are more matches. for the title match, yeah. Yeah, the title match is a lot easier to get out of the way. Finn Balor is defending against Karrion Cross. Karrion Cross is winning that belt. And they're getting back on track. Nothing else to say about this match. The <laughs> booking of Finn Balor has sucked on NXT. Oh, the cat's got claws, though. Yeah, meow. Um... <laughs> Dude's uh, cutting promos for Batman Returns. That's what it is. It seemed like a cool move at first, and then they muddied the waters with like, "Well, he's a heel, and isn't that exciting? Because he's gonna be the Prince Devitt, and like." Okay, cool. And then, granted, a million things happened to get, you know, to screw up the plans that were initially there. Nobody saw a pandemic coming. I think his first match was supposed to be against Gargano, who was injured and got replaced by Matt Riddle. So lots of things haven't gone their way, but still, he's sucked. And I'd rather him kind of just be on the main roster, where it's like at least you can add a name to one of the other shows that need it. Because at this point, nobody's touring. You're all on the same playing field. I think we're on SmackDown need Finn Balor right now. I have kind of mixed feelings towards the whole Finn Balor situation. Just because like, like part of me kind of sees the perspective that I've seen of some people talk about on Twitter, the idea that He's been pretty good as a champion just due to the fact that he has great matches and he is he's arrogant but not unlikably arrogant in, at least in my perspective in the fact that he just thinks he's the best on the entire roster and he's going to work his way for everybody to prove it and I think a lot of the kind of harm that was done to his title reign was due to the fact that he got injured in that match with Kyle O'Reilly and so basically had to sit out for two months which is something that's out of his control and out of everybody else's control. Yeah. Um, I'm more down on this match due to the carrying cross involvement. That's another thing. I don't like him that much. No, it's just... like He started off and you had that really interesting entrance to start off with. The entrance has whined on me over time. And I just don't think he's been particularly impressive in the ring. I just think he... He's obviously... He has a very intimidating presence and... He's got a good look and all the other stuff, and he's got Scarlet as well, so that's a bonus. But I just don't, I've not been interested in any of his matches so far. Like the match with Keith Lee, I thought sucked, but then again, that was due to the fact that he separated his shoulder about halfway through it. And everything else, like he now uses a running forearm to the back of the head, which looks, in a, in a world where I love moves like the Rainmaker and stuff like that, which is basically just a whipped back clothesline, that just looks lame. Agreed. I think he, I think he's, in his own head in a couple of his matches because he's worried about hurting his shoulder. Mm. And in one of his more recent matches, he injured a guy's shoulder. Or at least he was involved doing a move which injured uh, Danny Birch. So there's a lot of things surrounding him that I just rubs me up the wrong way. Don't get me wrong, I think he's winning the title here because that was the plan. I just I think that he's a guy who belongs more on the main roster than Finn Balor does. I feel like Vince would look at Karrion Cross and say, okay, I can do something with this guy until he forgets to do something with this guy. 
but then, <laughs> but at least he will at least initially have an idea. If Finn Balor goes back, he'll just say, "Hey, Finn," and he'll just assume that he was never gone in the first place. <laughs> and yeah, I could see and, that. And, it, and he'll just go back to being okay. We'll put you in the Intercontinental or US title picture and say nothing more about it. Whereas at least he'll come up with at least a, a month's worth of ideas for carrying Cross before giving up. So I think he's a guy that fits more on the main roster than Finn Balor does. But if it, if it was down to me, I would have Finn Balor retain here. But I think Karrion Cross is going to win. Yeah, I just... Like Callum very well said, this is basically the merging of everything that's gone wrong with this brand. Both of these guys have had such a snake-bitten year. The title and... has been, like, cursed. Yeah. So maybe the, Brent, that's Bray Wyatt just doing the wrong kind of curse. He's going for Randy, and he's ending up on the NXT title. Yeah, uh, it, it just doesn't feel that special. This match. It just feels yeah. like it. It feels like a match that you knew had to happen, rather than you wanted it to happen. It's and like, I'll say it's this. Like, yeah, it's like, wait, it's like Karen Cross dropped the title out of his like he won it, and then had to immediately drop it due to injury, and so you knew he was going to have to come back and fight for the title eventually. So it feels like it's a match that. Okay, this has been in the calendar at some point. Like we've got Finn Balor versus Karen Cross. We just need to pick a time and date to do it, rather than you actually, rather than actually like, in either towards the build for this match or anything involved in making me feel like, oh, I'm I'm so excited to see this match actually happening. Just saying, like, okay, this match is going to happen, and now it's happening, and I don't really care. And I'll parlay this, and we can segue into the other main event. I think Kyle O'Reilly and Adam Cole should be for the belt. For so many reasons. Adam Cole is the longest reigning champion. Kyle O'Reilly's huge upturn was built around wanting to become the champion. People care about this match. I'm over this idea that there are some matches that are bigger than the belt. Yes, that can be true. But I think we've seen it play out way too much recently. Where, yeah, but the bigger match needs to be for the belt to help the belt. Because the belt doesn't look as big. That's why part of me thinks that they're going to put that unsanctioned match uh, third to last and give, like, the women's tag match as, like, a buffer or the North American title match maybe as a buffer just so that way it's like, well, all right, Kyle O'Reilly and Adam Cole, they have a hell of a match. Organa then retains it or loses to Loomis. And that's the match that people can kind of like crap on a little bit. And then we'll go into the main event and then it'll end with, you know, new champion kind of a thing. See, but I kind of feel like don't allow the audience and there is a bit of a live one and the audience at home to like, don't blow your load before the end of the night. You know, just let the match that will get the highest rating and the biggest pop go on last. I always want the biggest, most important match to be the championship and to be the main event. But I'm in agreement with you guys about a lot of those things. I'm not, I've never been super high on Finn Balor the way that a lot of other people are. I've always thought that he is more than capable in the ring, but he's not the end all be all best professional wrestler in the history of the business that some people treat him as. I think that in particular, his character work is something that, People go nuts over where I just don't think that it's there for me, but he's solid enough in the ring and cross doesn't have the character yet, nor does he have the in ring presence yet for me to be able to trust that he's going to be great in this role. So I'm not super big on cross, but at the same time, I want to see what he has to offer as champion but do I really want to see a championship reign of just he's the unstoppable beast that wrestles once a month or so and I don't know, seven months from now somebody beats him for the title. I don't know if I'm really super into that. But then I don't know what they've got in mind. Maybe they've got some plans. I do think Cross wins that belt back and I think that it also could be a scenario where he doesn't hold it a super long amount of time. Now look at Keith Lee. We were like, oh, Keith Lee winning that title. Like, he should hold that for a little bit. 
but then he immediately loses it to Cross and goes up to the main roster. So maybe Cross is going to be one of those guys that by the time we get to SummerSlam, he's already up on Raw or SmackDown. Maybe. It really depends on how fast they want to rush things. Because as we saw with Keith Lee, things were rushed. To the point where, like, Stephanie has admitted on interviews and such that, yeah, in order to to increase ratings, they tried to just randomly bring people up, and it didn't work. You know, I don't know if we'll have that issue in 2021. 2021 is a weird year where we don't know where we're getting a lot of these things. Everything looks like it's cleaned up. But but it isn't. Every time that you hear something, you hear the opposite too. It ends up being like, well, now you can do this and now you can travel this and it's a lot easier, but also more people are dying and everything's getting spread worse and the variants are getting worse. And it's like, well, how is that? What? Right. Like, how are you Where getting like, thousands of people that are like, you can, you don't have to wear a mask now, but it, you're guaranteed to die. It's like, wait, what? <laughs> you know? Right. And I feel like 2021 is kind of a holding year. It, I know it's only April, but it feels like it's already in that role of like, we'll see how this one goes. And then maybe next year is the real launch, mm. you know? And that's unfortunate for NXT the most, but I really have nothing else to say about this world title match because this unsanctioned match is going to be a banger. There's no question that's going to be the better match. And for that matter, I'm trying not to get my expectations up too high to where it would be like, oh, I thought that this was going to be a match of the year and it really wasn't. And now it's only like an, an eight out of 10 and now I'm pissed or something like that. But I do think it's got a lot of potential to be one of those absolute classic matches because Kyle O'Reilly is great and Adam Cole is great. They got a hell of a feud going on right now. The passionate promos have sold me. The fact that it's unsanctioned means that they've got no rules and they can do whatever they need to do. So even though we don't need to have like, you know, them brawling with weapons and everything, that means that they can hang out outside the ring a little bit and do some stuff if they want to, or they can run into a situation where they do incorporate weapons just to kind of further along the idea that they're really hating each other. I think Roderick Strong's getting involved in this, and I hope that that doesn't screw things up. I'm leaning more towards Kyle O'Reilly wins, but there's, it's kind of like the, Is it your brain or is it your heart? In my heart, Kyle O'Reilly wins. My brain is telling me, though, WWE wants to double dip everything these days. They want, in every possible scenario, to drag something out. I don't think we've seen a single thing happen recently in the past two years, especially this past year, that WWE hasn't tried to make uh as many like as much as they can get out of it as possible even to the detriment of itself so there's a good portion of me that thinks in their mind Kyler Riley loses this and he does so through either Roderick Strong interferes it's intentional it's inadvertent whatever and then even though it makes no sense, mind you, and I'm not advocating for this, then they have the blow off on NXT TV. And that way, well, then we'll get people to tune into TV because they are very much harping on this whole TV matters more kind of thing. Yeah, 20, 2021 is that year solidified. I will say that, that TV matters more to the point where like it's it's WrestleMania SmackDown now. That's literally what they're calling it. Right. WrestleMania SmackDown. So there is that element. I, first of all, Callum pitched the idea a few months ago, a few months ago, a few weeks ago of uh, them doing a loser leaves NXT. And in a way, I'm glad they didn't because I was going to get really mad from a kayfabe standpoint that Gargano and Ciampa beat the shit out of each other for years and you never went, all right, enough of this. One of you has to go. So no, they I'm did. glad. No, they they didn't. just didn't follow through with it. Because remember, it. they did the whole thing where um, it was like, I don't know, it was like some kind of like an interference or whatever. Then 
Regal afterward was like, you know what, we're gonna have this different thing or something. I forget exactly what it was. No, it was Gargano had put his career on the line against Andrade. And Chavo Oh, that's right, Andrade. Andrade. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so I'm glad they didn't do that. I don't want to see this become another Champa Gargano. So I hope they throw in elements that has it feel fresh. But this is going to be easily the best NXT match. Maybe the best match of the week. I love these two guys. I'm spoiled in the sense that I don't watch this show as much because I'm always doing AEW coverage for Fightful. That when I see Adam Cole in the ring, I pop so much more because I don't see it as much. So I'm very much looking forward to this. I want to see what their music is going to be. And that's a footnote, but like they're getting individual theme songs and that's exciting to me. And yeah, I'm very curious to see how this plays out. But gun to my head, I'm going Kyle O'Reilly beats Adam Cole. So this match should be great because, again, because of the people involved. The fact that it's unsanctioned means that they can push the boundaries as far as they're willing to do. And we've seen that Cole can thrive in that sort of environment in particular. And I'm sure O'Reilly can do great things as well with him because they've had great matches on the independent scene, especially in Ring of Honor and in New Japan. They have like a really long, like long running feud between the two of them. So they had chemistry in the Undisputed Era. So they'll carry that forward to have a lot of chemistry in the ring in this match. I have a worry about this match in the sense that it might suffer from the, what I want to call NXT-itis, which is a match going on. And actually this is something that applies to AEW as well. So maybe it's more just a, like just a indie Modern wrestling wrestling (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. Just such that like this match will go on too long and it will start to, it's possible for it to do it because it's obviously it's a match. It's more of a concept, but it's the idea of like, it's a match that will, love the smell of its own fart yeah <laughs> same with yeah. that right it'll just it'll go on so it will be so self-indulgent with itself that it will start to parody itself a bit would you argue that that is the triple h philosophy of a little bit yes yeah. i mean I, it kind of like it kind it started to show it like rear its head during the gargano and champa feud and at the start of it like you really start to love it because oh God, they're doing these really long grandstand matches and when you first thing it's like oh this is super cool that they just seem to be going broadway all the time and they're doing more and more creative things but then it, eventually it starts burning you out and you just start thinking i'd rather like just see a fight between these two and i don't really care if it goes like 15 minutes or it goes 45 minutes but i just want to see them have a really good fight and tell a really good story and it goes as long as it needs to go rather than just okay, we've gone 20-something minutes now, so now's the time that we move on to doing a load of things where we hit Canadian Destroyers onto trash cans and loads of other stuff like that, and yet we still kick out because we need the This Is Awesome chance and all that other stuff. I just want them to be... I just want it to be a match, and I want them to... Well, I, want, I don't want it to be a match. I want it to be a fight. I want them to kick the shit out of each other because they've built up a really intense personal rivalry. So I want it to be crawling all over the place again you want to see those high spots as well but i'm more into the idea of them just more just like punching kicking and putting each other into really vicious submission moves more than i am seeing like panama sunrises through four stacks of tables or something like that so i'm I'm pretty sure they'll tell that story so i'm not too worried in that regard and i think it'll be one of the best matches of the entire nxt takeover across the two nights and i think it's I think Kyler Riley is going to win, but I also don't think this feud is over. In that Adam Cole will lose and then say that it's an unsanctioned match, so it doesn't count. I so, still think then, we're getting that, that Looser Leaves Town thing on TV, and that makes me lead more towards the... Like, Cole wins through some kind of bullshit, and Regal's like... Well, that's bullshit, you know. And then, yeah, Cole could be like, "Well, it's unsanctioned, you know, it doesn't really matter." And well, well no, I think that they're going to do something where Adam Cole, Adam Cole loses match to Kyler Riley, and then he'll get pissy about the fact that it wasn't a sanctioned match, so it doesn't count in the record books. 
and then you get the lose lose town match and then Cole loses that one as well. I don't think they're getting a fifty fifty Kyle O'Reilly. I'd be cool with Kyle O'Reilly winning both. Yeah, you should I like be. that. Because he's if if you're realistically gonna make him a main eventer and you and if you do have intentions of moving Adam Cole to the main roster, there is no benefit of having them fifty fifty in. Is this the first well, I guess not the first because AJ and Shinsuke, but they had a Wrestle Kingdom match for the Ring of Honor title. And this may be the first Wrestle Kingdom match to play itself out on NXT. They have a great story together. I could watch them wrestle all the time. I don't want to see the match begin to love to the smell of its own farts. I do like that analogy because, I, quite frankly, I think it's happened in a lot of the NXT main events in like the Cole Gargano Champa era, where like even Cole and Gargano, that last one, as good as it was, was like, holy shit, you know, this can end. And I don't want to see that. But I do want to see the coming out party for O'Reilly in a lot of ways. And that's why I think he has to win this. But I also don't know where Roger Strong factors in or where Bobby Fish factors in or where, you know, eventually I have to assume the winner of this will get an NXT title shot. Where does that factor in? So there's a lot of different elements. But right now I'm going to play it safe and go O'Reilly. I'll do the same. Even though I do think that there's a chance that Cole wins just to stretch it out, I'm going to ultimately go with O'Reilly. Same thing for you, Kyle. Yeah, I would say Kyle O'Reilly wins. And I do think they do stretch it out, but I don't think Adam Cole's getting a win in this series. And I am excited about these two nights more so than I am about some of the other things about this whole week that we've got going on. I'm assuming, for instance, that TakeOver is going to be better than well, it's definitely going to be better than the Hall of Fame. And <laughs> I'm assuming that it's going to be way better than Prelude. I am also assuming that I'm going to be happier at the end of TakeOver than I am at WrestleMania. So we will find out about that, whether or not that's true, when those shows happen. And remember, the way that we're going to be doing this whole week is we're going to be hitting you with a whole lot of podcasts. We still have to do our predictions for WrestleMania, but we're going to do that on Wednesday. And we're going to do post shows for both nights of NXT TakeOver. We're also going to do post shows for both of the nights of WrestleMania. And they're both, or all four of them, I should say, not both. All four of them are going to be the live shows on YouTube. So remember, if you hit that little notification bell and you have the email alert set up, that will let you know when we go live directly instead of being like, well, we're going to start as soon as we can after the shows. Sometimes that's five minutes. Sometimes it's 15. It all kind of depends on the articles that I'm writing and setting up the thing and whether or not we're having audio issues or, you know, we, we did with one of the most recent ones where I had my audio set up uh, completely botched since my microphone got all messed up and whatever. I'm pretty sure that I fixed that by now, but who knows? So if you want to make sure that you are fully aware of when we go live, Stay tuned to the YouTube channel around those time frames, but set up the email alerts. That way you'll know, okay, they actually officially went live. And then you'll get more uh, of our thoughts about takeover with those kind of things. And we'll be breaking down the results that happen and our perception of everything. Just the same as we want you to leave your comments and tell us the same things that you guys have to think. So we will wrap things up here just by giving you guys some other ideas of what's going forward and what you should look out for. Um, obviously, follow everything on Smart Cat Moment and Fanboys Anonymous. That's the general sweeping plug of everything. You can also follow me at Tony Mango on Facebook and Twitter to find out what else I've got going on because I'm writing up plenty of stuff for e-wrestling news and for Bleacher Report and for instance, one of the things I wrote up recently that you might be interested in is the history and the evolution of the WrestleMania logo. Check that out on the I, I used com. that article recently to illustrate to my friend that, yes, there was an option for Peacock to not just butcher the WrestleMania 2 logo. <laughs> yeah, it's uh, I don't, know, I don't know if they fixed that yet, but they probably haven't. They have not. Ugh, it's terrible. I don't know why you just put the little dot on paint. 
it could take me two seconds to do it. I don't know what the hell I'm doing. Then. <laughs> but check that out. Check out all the other kind of content. Uh, I have a guide up on EWN as well for anybody who wants to know exactly what's like happening for this WrestleMania week for like this gets uploaded to Peacock and that's what they're advertising for this. And this time is when that airs and everything. So it's kind of like a handy dandy viewers guide, but plenty of other things happening there. These guys also have other things that they're going to be working on. Rob's having another week like I'm having where he's just going to be completely brain dead by next Monday. <laughs> so for the first time since at least 2018, you're probably going to hear Callum more on this channel than you're going to hear me. Because I won't be on the post show for WrestleMania or the Wednesday show. I may be here for Thursday. I should be. But yeah, you're going to hear a lot more of Callum because I'll be over at Fightful.com doing the Wednesday Night War podcast with Alex Pulowski and potentially Sean Ross Sapp. It depends on what WWE's schedule is as far as media calls. Uh, and the Saturday shows, I'll probably be, be doing live watch-alongs and the live post-show of WrestleMania Night 1 and Night 2 over at Fightful.com, so check that out. But please, of course, support these great two guys because they're great and they have great opinions and you should hear them. And, of course, follow me on Twitter at DudeFelice. And now here's Callum. Okay, I just need to get into character a second. Pew, pew, pew. <laughs> Listen up, partners. <laughs> you better darn sure be heading over to smartcatmoment.com right now and perusing all the great articles we've got up right now, including the power rankings composed by the hottest shot in all of the east of England, Cowboy Callum Wiggins. <laughs> <laughs> and when you've got your fill of all that, you can mosey on down to Smart Cat Moment YouTube channel or the podcast feeds, pour yourself a nice glass of scotch, rum, or apple juice, sit back and listen to myself and Deputy D. Felice recap the dying days of the Attitude Era and the origins of the Ruthless Aggression Era in both 2001 Arresting Odyssey and the Paul Heyman Smackdown podcast. And if you want to avoid a cold, lonely night in the pokey, then you better be sure to follow me on Twitter at Wigmeister14. Yeehaw. <laughs> I reckon that might be your best... <laughs> <laughs> that you've done in a while. I am right. I am reading from a script right now. Yeah, boy, howdy! With the guns in my head. It's a one of those quick draw guns, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, it just, well, bang, it just says bang when you pull the trigger. Yeah. Well, if you are interested in dueling pistols at dawn with a cowboy Callum Wiggins or whatever, then maybe that'll happen in some future live event. I don't know, but the. Uh, the train's going to keep rolling along here and uh, some of those cowboys here and then jump on. And we hope that you are a part of that crew. We hope that you continue to tune in to everything that we are going to be bringing you over the next couple of days. And obviously going forward, don't just leave us after that point, but show us some support, hit that like button, hit the share button, hit up the Patreon, check out the merchandise shops on T public and Redbubble, and just stay tuned. And we will see you when we see you, but at least for now for the short amount of time frame until we talk to you again. <laughs> this has been another Smart Out Moment, and we're being counted out.